Um, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker who will guide us through what has happened since the 2009 National Academies report. Uh, it, we are very fortunate to have with us this morning Dr. John Butler. He's an internationally renowned expert in forensic DNA analysis. He's pioneered methods used today worldwide uh, for DNA testing in criminal cases, paternity cases, and ancestry procedures. He's written uh, five textbooks since uh, 2001. Uh, he's given hundreds of lectures in the US and worldwide. He served on multiple committees and also has received many, many awards and <coughs> served as the vice chair of the National Commission on Forensic Science. Join me in welcoming Dr. Butler. Okay, well thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today and to kind of give you a, a brief history of where we've come in the last uh, decade. That's my challenge for today. And uh, the points I'll make are mine and not those of, of NIST. And if I mention any products, I'm not endorsing them. So as we look, uh, kind of why should we look at a historical review? If you want to understand yesterday, you have to search, or if you want to understand where we are today, we need to search where we came from. Search yesterday is what Pearl Buck said. And also we've probably familiar with this quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so if we can learn from where we come from, perhaps we can go forward even further in the future. So Tom, Tom showed um, the picture I wanted to go through briefly, the 13 recommendations that were, um, were part of this report. And this is a kind of a succinct um, grouping that uh, Sue Ballou put together earlier this year in a, in a report that she published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences, but really the most important one up front is the first one, which is to establish a National Institute of, of uh, Forensic Science is what would call for Congress to be able to do that. That hasn't happened, of course. But from there, these other things were encouraged that we have standard terminology for reports and testifying, that there be we address issues of validity and accuracy and, and reliability and so on, that there be a separation of, of labs from law enforcement agencies, that we do research on uh, human bias and so on, um, codes of ethics, um, and developing programs to help attract students. And so there's certainly there's a lot that's gone on. And in the time I have, I'm not going to be able to go through all of these in detail. But I will point out that there's a Google search found from Google Scholar. There's been more almost 1,000 citations to this report. So certainly people are referring back to the report. And then we have, uh, from a recent legal review, I think there's been about 218 or so um, references in the legal literature to, to uh, forensic just to this report. So certainly it's well aware of. Um, there's been several summaries kind of what have, have happened previously. There was a White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, research strategy working group that put together a five-year summary of where we were kind of at that point. And then I've, I've written a couple articles, kind of um, the things that have happened with building the National Commission and OSAC. And, some of those activities have been published, and those are available in the open access literature. And so when this PDF becomes available, there's links on these to be able to go to those, those articles if you want. So where to begin kind of looking at a decade of, of development? Um, we could c consider possibly where you know, congressional hearings have been held, what kind of books have been published, what kind of reports have been issued, um, what kind of media coverage has there been, uh, what kind of training courses have been offered, has there been important research published? What kind of meetings have been held? Uh, and what kind of major activities have happened? We've had the Subcommittee on Forensic Science, the National Commission on Forensic Science, the Organization of Scientific Area Committees. So there's a lot that could be covered here. And so as I thought about how to try to touch on this, I'll, I'll show you a, a timeline of, of these pieces. But there have been six congressional hearings on forensic science since 2009. I list them here, four from the Senate and two from the House. And there have, and I list all the various presenters. Uh, this one here, the second one, kind of the science and standards of forensic science is what led to really a lot of the discussions that led to the commission and to OSAC being formed with the director of NIST, Patrick Gallagher, uh, presenting there. And there was more, uh, very recently, about two months ago, that was held kind of where are we in terms of raising the bar and looking at future needs in forensic science and Subaloo from NIST. Uh, spoke as well as Lynn Garcia from the Texas Forensic Science Commission, uh, Vicki Bahena from uh, Oklahoma Innocence Project, uh, Karen Cafedar from the University of Virginia and the American Statistical Association, and Matt Gamme from 
the CFSO and ASCLAD and, and the Idaho State Police. So there have been a number of hearings that have happened, and so we can learn certainly from looking at those things what have been said. There's been lots of books published. Uh, this is just a few that I captured uh, since 2009 that have been written on the topic. So you can see that there's a lot that certainly has been published. And, this, and there's really a growing literature. This is just literature on fingerprint analysis, and you'll hear more from Joanne Biscalia later this morning about the, the, what the FBI white box and, and black box studies that they've done. And these are just some of the studies and, and some other ones that people have done to try to improve our knowledge of what's there. So I thought I'd try to put together a quick uh, timeline and give you a, a, just a, a drive, drive through of where we, the, we've come in the last decade. So since the report came out in February of 2009, uh, there was a, 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 a Arizona State University at their law school had a big uh, conference that was held kind of discussing that, and that led to a lot of, number of other discussions. There was the congressional hearing that I mentioned in, in the fall of that year, and then the White House Office of Science Technology Policy introduced a subcommittee on forensic science that operated for several years, and both the co-chairs for that are here. Ken Melson and Mark Stoller were the co-chairs for that effort. Uh, there was uh, the National um, Science Foundation had a cognitive bias workshop, and I think Rebecca Farrell will cover that and some other topics more. Um, we've already heard from um, Jennifer Manukin published a number of articles on this topic, but this is one on research culture that needed to be encouraged that uh, she mentioned in the uh, UCLA Law Review in 2011. And since that time, we've had a lot of research that's happened. We'll hear about that from, our, uh, from the FBI. Um, for example, and Joanne Biscali will talk about some of the work that they've done there. We'll hear from NIJ in the next session as well about the things that they've been funding, uh, things we will hear from NIST, the work that's gone on there, and also from NSF. Uh, there's human factors. We'll hear more about that this afternoon and efforts that have gone on to look at fingerprints and the human factors there. Um, there's been introduction of uh, APHIS interoperability. Um, that's come out. The, the NIJ has a Forensic Technology Center of Excellence. I think we'll probably hear more about that. Um, there's a Dear Colleague letter that came out in 2013 from the National Science Foundation as well. And there was an effort for several years to, to um, look at research strategy and kind of a working group was formed by OSTP and that operated for, through the end of 2013 and beginning of 2014 uh, before the National Commission started. And that's where the progress report that I mentioned earlier, the kind of the five-year progress report uh, was, was published. And if you haven't seen that before, that's a good place to kind of look back at where we were after five years. Uh, NIST has had a series of uh, presentations about every two years on research updates. And we'll hear more from Robert Thompson about work in the bullets, uh, efforts in the, the ballistics, measurements, firearms identification. There's been Interpol has had a number of reviews every three years. Interpol has a review of what's happening in the literature, and thousands of articles are reviewed um, at every three years as part of that. The last one just happened about a month ago, and so there'll be reports coming out from that. Um, the NSF came up with a industry a university cooperative research centers, and several of those are operational now in forensic science, so we'll see where that kind of takes us as we go forward. We have CSAFE, and we'll hear a little bit more about that today, is a center of excellence that NIST has, has funded. Um, the Innocence Project has, has pointed out some of the challenges that exist in, in forensic science. Brandon Garrett's book uh, talked about in 2011, Convicting the Innocent. Um, oops. Um, the FBI had a hair review that has operated for several years with, with input from the Innocence Project. Um, we've had more. I mentioned there was there's several in 2012 and 2013 congressional hearings that happened, looking at kind of where the field is. Um, there was a, a memorandum of understanding between DOJ and NIST that was signed in February 2013, and that led to the formation of the National Commission on Forensic Science and to the Organization of Scientific Area Committees for Forensic Science that is still uh, operational, and that's led to the formation of the AFS Standards Board to, a, to a write uh, documentary standards coming out of OSAC, and also strengthening of ASTM International, uh, again, making standards that can help with uh, documenting and improving the practice of forensic science. We've had uh, strengthening, I think, within the accreditation efforts, and certainly there's been a new version of the ISO 17025 that came out in 2017. Um, Tom Albright talked about the eyewitness uh, National Academy of Sciences study that came out in 2014. 
Uh, the Texas Forensic Science Commission, uh, has, this is a bite mark uh, report that they came out with a couple years ago. Uh, forensic science has made the front cover of science. Uh, and this is the bullets from NIST, uh, some research studies that have gone on that made the front cover. Uh, we've had uh, articles, of course, in National Geographic and other um, media sources. And in 2016, the PCAST report was published in September of 2016 with an addendum in, in a January of 2017, there was a Harvard Law Review, um, oh, sorry, Harvard Law a School Panel that was held in October 2017, I think was, was quite interesting looking kind of the legal intersections with some of these points. And there's a committee, um, I think we'll probably hear more about this later today, on the Federal Rules of Evidence 702 and the efforts that are going on looking at that. There was a call for a more science and forensic science published in PNAS uh, last year. And you know, calls for forensic reform uh, in law review articles and, and so on. Um, there's been efforts uh, most recently since the commission came out with the desire to have the technical merit reviews. Um, there's been efforts to uh, look at this, and we'll hear, I think, this afternoon from the National Institute of Forensic Science in Australia, their efforts with uh, forensic fundamentals and looking at some of the, the basics, knowledge of what we do know in the field. We've, we've heard about AAAS has come out with two studies on fire investigation and latent fingerprints that came out uh, two years ago and looking again at where do the, these fields stand. And NIST has begun efforts now with scientific foundation reviews with congressional funding, first with DNA mixture interpretation, we can bite mark evidence and now starting one in, in firearms uh, examination. So again there's been a further uh, congressional hearings in 2017 and 2019, kind of seeing where we are and where we uh, need to go. And of course, more funding and resources are important to be able to move some of these things forward. The Department of Justice has uh, issued 14, I think, so far of their uniform language and te uh, test for testimony and uh, reporting. And there's a new flint twig that's just started that's trying to develop uh, strategic approaches to uh, introducing new technology and some of the, addressing some of the needs in the communities. And I think we'll hear more about that from NIJ today. Um, and back in 2013, there was a conference that, we, that uh, NIST helped organize on forensic governance. And I'll mention that uh, as well in the next slide. But I think what we're going to hear uh, from the Virginia and from the Houston lab is, is where, how the rubber hits the road with, um, real, with really trying to implement new things. Uh, we have at NIST, we've done two conferences on error management in 2015 and 2017, looking at some of the challenges with how reporting errors and moving forward with, with this. We've also had conferences on looking at the weight of evidence, uh, looking at how do we implement research and into the field and, and going from innovation to implementation. And then we most recently, last month, had a conference on evidence um, management and how do we how do we uh, make sure that evidence is properly stored and, and, and conveyed to people? Uh, we have, back in 2013, NIST and NIJ did a, a kind of biological evidence um, uh, preservation and how that things can be uh, pr preserved there. We had a D FBI and, and NIST uh, organize a joint um, effort, a DNA Technical Leaders Summit, to look at some of the challenges with DNA mixture interpretation. The DC lab was closed in 2015 because of mixture interpretation, which is one of the reasons we're focusing efforts on the scientific foundation reviews in this area. And then I think most uh, recently, for the DNA folks, uh, investigative genetic genealogy has become a, a new um, opportunity to kind of explore new challenges because now we have to deal with how do we face the issues of privacy and, and <coughs> the need for security and uh, coping with that and, with, and connecting that with the general public. So there's a lot that's been happening in the last decade. I would also re refer you to the National Commission, when it concluded two years ago, published a 58-page report uh, reflecting back and looking forward towards the future. And it has a lot of things that still need to be worked on that have been, that were addressed at that time. So um, that's my kind of quick overview of the last 10 years. Um, <laughs> So just in the last couple of minutes I have, just to mention this, this meeting was held at the DC Crime Lab in 2013. One of the things that came out of it was a white paper that is still available on kind of how to organize and govern um, forensic labs from the perspective of the National, uh, from the Netherlands Forensic Institute, and I commend that as something worth looking at. The National Commission had 13 meetings that uh, allowed the opportunity to have great discussions and 
to coordinate government efforts, to uh, learn from previous efforts, and to introduce new efforts. Um, we had 140 different presenters that spoke in the 13 meetings we had there. And I think that uh, you can go back and look at those. Um, those uh, we, NIST still maintains those uh, videos if anybody wants to go back and see some of the discussions that were held on this topic. Of course, it closed two years ago with the charter expiration. But again, I refer you to the report, the 58-page uh, kind of summary of what happened uh, in summary, summarizing that. Uh, Jules Epstein, one of the commissioners, wrote an article last year in the Law Review, just kind of, is, was the commission impactful or ineffectual uh, with a question mark? And I think that still remains to be seen as we go forward with, did, or did we learn from these things from the hist history there? NIST uh, continues to uh, support forensic activities in primarily these four buckets, and Robert Ramontowski will go over these in more detail in terms of conducting research, partnering with the community, convening meetings, and then exploring the scientific foundations. But I want to step back for a moment and talk about history and look at um, Wilmer Souter, who was the first forensic scientist at NIST. In 1932, he published these four um, ideals for, for, for firearms identification. That we should have minimum standards of equipment, that we have standards for records of evidence, that we have standards for the qualification of experts, we have methods for uh, constantly following up with experts that are testifying in court. And in, I would say that 87 years later, we're still addressing these same challenges. And so that's part of the, why it's valuable to look back at history and see what have, we, what have we learned from these things. So OSAC is certainly making efforts to prepare and promulgate documentary standards. Efforts are being made here, but there's still a lot to be done in terms of standardizing requirements for equipment and so on. Uh, in terms of standards on reports and case uh, record contents, you know, ISO 17025 is labs are credit to that provides much of that, but there can be more that can be done there. Uh, PCAS may request for empirical data that we need to support the conclusions, and I think there's a growing effort to address that. And then finally, DOJ is doing FBI examiner testimony evaluation and to ensure compliance to their alters, and I think that's a, that's a good start on things. But I, I would say, are we learning from history or are we, st are we repeating it? And sometimes, uh, as we look back at where we come from, it's, it's uh, valuable to appreciate that. Uh, a psychologist uh, who was the director of research at the U.S. Civil Service Commission in 1936 spoke to the International Com Association of Chiefs of Police, and he said the following, <laughs> that we need to use as a basis for evidence instruments whose validity is n not known will merely discredit the investigation work. And he pleads for greater knowledge of validity of scientific methods and the development of more valid measures. And finally, he proposes setting up a National Bureau of Standards in Criminology uh, which we think of National Institute of Forensic Science that was proposed 73 years later, to conduct scientifically controlled experiments to evaluate present practices and emphasizes if we want to make, we need to make better use of scientific methods, the law enforcement agencies must be certain of their limitations as well as their merits. And I still think that, that those things apply. Uh, finally, I'll just finish with this, that we have a call for more science and forensic science, Tom Albright being one of the authors of this that came out in PNAS last year, and three statements from it. Uh, DNA evidence and its success has changed our views and expectations of forensic science. I certainly think that's the case. That forensic techniques should be subjected to independent validation before being introduced into common use was the conclusion that they drew. And finally, that research and academic scientists should become educated about forensic science and take active steps to welcome the discipline into the larger scientific community. And I love the fact we let off with Tom Albright talking about how basic science things can, can benefit and strengthen forensic science if we'll listen and learn from it. And I hope that we will communicate and collaborate as we go forward. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to address questions um, now, or we're probably out of time, so we may have to do that uh, later. But thank you. <laughs>